Hello, campers. It's a super sunny day here at camp. A perfect welcome for our foreign exchange students from Sweden, Pele and Maya. They are very eager and excited to share with us their customs. In fact, I've been told it's a celebration specifically for this time of year, the middle of summer. A midsummer, if you will. <laughs> I can honestly say, I think today is going to be a great day. Something this camp could really use. Huh. Now, if I could only find Christian, Mark, and Josh. I'm sure they're fine. Anyway, let's bear down the welcome wagon. And don't forget our special bonfire tonight. Welcome in, campers, to Bunk 237, ah, horror movie podcast, the tripped out world we made up so we can drink weird color tea, maybe alcoholic, or other stuff, and talk horror movies. I'm one of your hosts, Tia Wen. And I'm your other host. Robin Slotnick, thank you for joining us on this wonderful evening, afternoon, morning, whenever, wherever you are. Um, our wonderful guest today is Alicia Sweeney. We are so excited to have her. She is a radio DJ and local music director for NPR Music Member Station, Indie 102.3, from Colorado Public Radio. Um, and she's a massive horror fan and <laughs> has some very cool stories that I need to hear more about, like the time that you helped George Romero out of a taxi cab. Tell me everything. First well, of all, welcome. Thank you for being here. <laughs> thanks for having me. Okay, the coolest thing happened. I was at Sundance in the year 2008, and Diary of the Dead was making its premiere. That was like one of uh, Romero's last films. And he happened to be there, and I was attending the screening that he was going to. And of course, as it is in Park City, Utah, during Sundance Film Festival, it's snowy outside, and this elderly couple pulls up in a, in a taxi cab. And me being like the kind human that I am, I would just help anybody out of a taxi cab. So this old guy's trying to get out of a taxi cab, and I go, oh, sir, I can help you. And he looks up and he has his iconic oh George Romero God. glasses on. <laughs> and I was like, oh, hello, Mr. Romero. Let me help you out of the cab. And it was like the best moment ever. It was also at that festival where I got to meet my horror icon, Wes, um, Freddy Krueger, a.k.a. Robert England. That was the best. I also got to see oh a film God. that he was in. I got to see the debut at Slam dance of paranormal activity which like people hate it and, and so I saw like the first version of that before it got all like fancy and Hollywoodized and it was a wild wow. time so that's just a little itsy bitsy glimpse in, into my love of horror films and how I've sort of chased it over the years that's, that's amazing exciting. that is so exciting um oh I love all of those stories I also want to hear actually want to trade Elijah Wood stories with you because I also worked at the Stanley Film Festival, which was a horror movie film festival in Colorado. Um, I worked the first year and the third year, and Elijah Wood, big horror fan, Inspector Vision, other things, uh, would attend the festival years two and three and on. Um, and so I feel like everyone has kind of a boring Elijah Wood story. Like mine is that I was standing with him at the back of a theater while a movie was starting. Um, and because I worked the festival, he, like we knew, like he knew who I was, and mm -hmm. I definitely knew who he was. Uh, but I made a joke because I can't stop myself from doing that in front of people. <laughs> I made a nervous, weird joke and he laughed and he like squeezed my elbow and then I died. And that is my Elijah Wood story. Okay. Was that year two <laughs> or year three? That was year three. So I interviewed him um, for year two when he was there at the Stanley Film Festival. And that's also when I stayed at the Stanley Hotel in room 303, which is a very Colorado thing. Um, and while I was there, when I was sleeping, my toes totally got tickled by a ghost. Really? Oh. I, I think so. Like me and my partner That's were in there and I'm like, I hear stuff. And then I'm sleeping and then I'm like, someone's trying to wake me up by tickling my tootsies. I want to stay in a haunted hotel. Right? So bad. 
And you know who got to stay in room 237 that year? Um, Joe Dante, the creator of Gremlin. Oh. So many wonderful horror films over the year. He was the featured like director icon that year. And so he and his wife got to stay in room 237. And she says she got her toes tickled too. And when we talked about that, the, the next day I was like, okay, this is totally true. That's cool. There's ghosts that like the uh, like toe. perverted. Yeah. Perverted yeah. feet loving. Ghosts. <laughs> they get the pervy ghost. <laughs> uh, guys, I think we should talk about other things that tickle our feet, like cults in Sweden. <laughs> Nailed it. Familiar. Transition. Perfect. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> so the movie that we're talking about today is something I feel like we were going to talk about inevitably, uh, be, just because there's no way that we were not going to get through a season without talking about 2019's Midsommar, uh, directed by Ari Aster, distributed by A24. The folksy horror flick follows young Danny, a woman we encounter at probably one of the lowest points of her life. Her sister has killed herself and their parents. Uh, Danny is left alone, mired in grief, with her emotionally distant and, frankly, shitty boyfriend, Christian. And that's the opening scene. Uh, <laughs> the two tag along with his friend group to Sweden, where they innocently kind of go to a commune for a research project slash college vacation vibe. Uh, they do drugs, and they unwittingly participate in the commune's murderous cultural traditions. This movie is a long, wild weird ride and if you've watched it and you're listening to this i know you have an opinion on it because everyone has a strong opinion on it and to be honest for me i've noticed and maybe you guys have noticed this too but my cis male friends tend to have different feelings about it <laughs> than any other group of people that is so true in fact bef as i was prepping for the podcast i wanted to take like an instagram poll just of asking men like, how do you feel about Midsummer? Because, yeah. I mean, th they totally do have a different feel. What do you think, Robin? I this, It's so interesting, like, how much of a cultural moment this movie became. And I I want I want to know why you guys think that is. Like, the, the I ha actually have a badge for the couple's costume badge for the bear and the, and the May Queen gown. Because I feel like people who didn't even watch the movie were dressing up in these costumes. And it, it just felt to me like... Uh, even though obviously Danny and Christian were th thrust into this crazy situation, everyone, there were tinges of everyone's relationships in their relationship, you know, like even if, even if your relationship wasn't as terrible and wasn't as dysfunctional as theirs, like every woman has apologized when she shouldn't have apologized, you know? And yeah. like those moments are just so ugh, emotionally like, yeah. frustrating I think that, to like, watch on screen. I think that people who hang on to bad relationships longer than they should, which is a lot of women, I think that they definitely feel differently about this movie because of that. And I think that maybe that's, and maybe, I don't know. It's interesting that you asked sort of culturally in the bigger picture why it was such a touchstone for people. I also was thinking about how it came out in 2019 and how it was like, wow, that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Right. But also at the same time, does it feel like very long ago? Because it's, you know, we've pretty much yeah, lost a year. It's interesting because it's like the idea of like uh, men and women in this movie and relationships in the era of like 2019 of like online dating and social media and ghosting being like a normal thing and sort of more people and women talking about uh, sort of communicating in relationships and how you can mm -hmm. be and how you should be and how you can stand up for yourself. Um, and how you don't need to be dragged along by some dude, I guess. And I right. wonder if all, I mean, that's a big, that's a big question, all that sort of it's mixture of everything culturally. Too. Yeah. It's a lot of, like, it's when we're all, you know, we're starting to talk about emotional abuse and verbal abuse and yeah. recognizing those signs and, um, and yeah, like emotional labor and all that stuff that's yeah. sort of like super in the forefront of the conversation at that point. Yeah. And, and I thought Florence Pugh was so incredibly credible playing this woman that always makes herself small to make men feel bigger. And again, looking at 2019 and hashtag me too and everything like 
me too. Like I get it and yeah. everything, but I love that she gets the last laugh in the end. Totally. Mm -hmm. I feel like every woman I know that watched it was like, fuck yeah, that movie rules. Everything was great. <laughs> I loved everything about it. Everything, the ending, like every, like, I don't think anyone felt all the women I know were all on Danny's side at the end of it. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you know, it's interesting. I have this friend and I was talking to her recently about Midsummer, and she was like, that's my favorite movie. She's like, I've watched it like 12 times just this year. She says she puts it on while she's like making dinner for the night. She's like, I love the cinematography. I love the costumes. I just love the vibe. And then she had this really interesting thought. It's all about, so she like got out of a, a bad relationship. My friend that I'm talking about for her, it was a divorce. And she learned what she wanted in a partner by watching a certain scene in Midsummer, when Pella says, Danny, do you feel held by him? Does he feel like home to you? And my yes. friend says that that part really resonates with her. And that's her favorite part of the movie. And it made her realize like, that's what I want in a man. I want someone that makes me feel like home, not someone who controls me. Those lines like ch are chilling to me right? <laughs> at that moment, especially. That moment yes. especially. I think later when Pele, like when he when he starts to present himself as like um sort of a person in her life that will be there for her and invited her into this world very purposely invited mm -hmm. her into this world and to be a part of this knowing that she sort of had this um this big hole in her heart and in her life um and like later on like towards the end uh after she gets crowned the May Queen and then he comes up and just like hugs her and just kisses her like full on mouth kisses mm -hmm, her in mm -hmm. like the sweetest way. That was like, I wasn't mad at him either for all everything, yeah. like, everything he put this friend group through. I know what you mean. And that's the effed up thing. And the interesting thing about the film, just if we pull it back a little bit where here's these unsuspecting Americans that are just going to watch this, you know, nine day, ritual this you know this summer celebration and they're all going there and they show up and every all the cult you know they don't know it's a cult but all the members are so friendly and loving to them and they don't realize that those are the people that are going to end up killing them you know there's that huge role reversal where it's like oh yeah. these american assholes do they deserve to die from these really nice people that are just luring them there so that they can use them for you their know work? it's an interesting point that you make but the way that the the cult is the bad guy you know right like in, in a general sense because i mean murderous cults we're not into except for oh, well, this movie <laughs> we're not we're not pro murderous cults i don't think you know um but uh it's interesting the way you said that this cult sort of lured them in uh sort of in this way but it seems to parallel the way christian treated danny do you know what i mean mm -hmm. sort of like i think that she was like she was in the relationship thinking that he was like this like safe space for her and that she was the one that was bad, but it, you know, right. he was bad. And I wonder if you kind of flip that. You're like, you come into this commune, which honestly is beautiful and idyllic. Like, you I know, know, I am a very community oriented person <laughs> and I am very susceptible to cults. Every time I watch a cult <laughs> documentary, like 30 minutes into any cult documentary, I'm like, I think I would do that. Yeah, I would. Okay. Can I, <laughs> is this cult still happening? Cause I would join right now. I, <laughs> I'm very susceptible to the idea of community and people coming together and sharing things yeah. and communicating. And I'm very, very into that. <laughs> Unfortunately, I would, I would get taken immediately. Um, but that's also maybe the cult of relationships too. Is that a weird thing to say? <laughs> like a bad relationship is kind of like being in a cult. It's true. Um, I, I read an interview with Ari Aster where he, he, basically calls this movie first of all he considers this movie a breakup movie before a, a horror movie before a folk horror movie um which made me feel better about feeling happy at the end <laughs> you know yes yeah, yeah. At the, like for me christian is so immediately terrible in, in like such a tangible way that uh, I was he was immediately the villain for me from like you know scene one and then at the very end 
end, there's that scene where he gets drugged and he's having sex with that woman and you feel a little bad for him because you're like, well, this is pretty much rape and like, you know, this is bad. But then you remember how terrible he is. So when that ending comes, you know, like we've talked about this movie on the podcast before because it was in the very first episode of the podcast. It was the one that one of the movies that I cannot stop thinking about Mm -hmm. Um, when when she smiles at the end. The first time I saw it, I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> like, you go, girl. <laughs> you did it. Um, yeah. I remember talking about it, and you were so ecstatic. Like, yes. And, it was and a as feel-good movie. <laughs> it was a feel-good movie for me. And I totally get Alicia, your friend, who wa- who puts it on to, like, feel better and feel comforted. And I, I totally get that. Um, the more that I've read about it and, and, and watched it, I, I do understand like how sinister the, the cult really is in all of this. Yes. Um, and there is that like fairy tale element um, where, and, and I think Ari Aster has said this as well, where like everyone else in the movie is in a folk horror and Danny's in a fairy tale. Mm-hmm. She's, she be, she's orphaned oh, at the beginning that's very and good. she ends up royalty at the end and finding her people, you know, very fairy tale thing. But it's, you know, she was also gaslit by this cult and she was also lured in and she was also taken advantage of by these people. So it's like, is this really the better solution like, for her? I feel like a really like a big question that I think probably differs, the answer probably differs from person to person is like, did Christian deserve it? At the end right. of the movie, when he is drugged and then stuffed and sewn into a bare suit bear skin <laughs> and then burned alive i mean i know he was a shitty boyfriend but did he deserve <laughs> right death i i i'm team two yet like i agree did he deserve it probably not but remember when christian at the beginning of the film like once they get to sweden and he's like it's cool babe you know it's just their customs it's their culture it's their way of life just keep going with it <laughs> So, like, maybe he did in the end. Yes. And that's the thing. Is, I thought that the beauty of this movie is it pulls you into the world so much that you are with her. And, you know, and, and it paints Christian as such a shitty dude. Yeah. It does. He, he it does. keeps, not just to her, but then he steals his friend's thesis. Yes. Like, just I know. And then unnecessarily was... bad stuff that he's doing. Yeah, dude. Dude, so, I mean, and from the beginning, he was always a bad boyfriend. He never had a single redeeming moment. And every little thing was like, he was condescending. He was mean. He was like, he kind of was always checking out other women. He said sort of, he, you know, let his friends say negative things about her, which I think is already just a bad sign. And early on, the friend group sucks too. He forgot her yeah. birthday. He like has no integrity, you know, like he, he sucks as a human being. But it's hard for me to be like, well, I mean, it was cool to see him die, but it wasn't, you know, he was just, he was a bad date. He was a bad date. Yeah. I don't know if that deserves watching, that. Watching this movie this time around, the birthday scene really got to me because when he pulls her outside to give her that sad piece of cake and he's <laughs> struggling, he's struggling to light the candle. Behind them is a group of women all huddled around holding one of them's holding a baby and they're all huddled around and they're all swaying together. And you're like, oh, the forefront of Danny's life, Christian and his shitty forgetting birthday is like so not what she needs. What she wants and what she needs is right behind her. Those women who are a community who are all taking care of each other and this child. (laughs) It's like it was the visual was just very good. Yes. There are so many cool little moments of foreshadowing with with his storytelling that I really like coming back and revisiting it and watching it because the first time I saw it, I only I saw the director's cut at the movie theater, um, you know, and it was like this big, big ado, like all, you know, our Denver favorite horror people are there and everybody's dressed up and stuff. It's a whole thing. And then like, I didn't realize it was going to be like three hours long or whatever. <laughs> it's so long. I love this movie, but it's very very long. long. (laughs) Yes. We can agree on that. It totally (laughs) is. And then, and then, yeah, like going back to it and rewatching it, 
there's all this like interesting foreshadowing, like even the first 20 seconds when the movie first begins and there's that gorgeous like folktale art, which basically tells you the whole plot of the movie right there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I, so when I rewatched it, I paused it because I also like didn't notice it that first or second yeah. time I watched it and then pausing it and just looking at that mural, I was like, oh, that's, this is the yeah. whole movie. And then I realized, and this should get a badge, the foreshadow or what badge, yeah. because like once you've seen it a couple times, you can see how constantly the movie oh, yeah. is telling you everything that's happening. Every character, like every person in this cult tells you what's happening. This is actually one of my my kind of like favorite little conversations when um, Pella, who is a who is the one that's introducing the cult and he's talking about their traditions and how from like zero to 18, you're considered a kid. Mm -hmm. Um, And then like 18 to like 36 is in this era. Uh, 18 to 36 is your pilgrimage and that's the summer. 36 to 54, your working age and that's the fall. Uh, 54 to 72 is your, your mentor and that's to represent winter. And then Danny asks him, like jokingly, what happens at seventy two? And he does that like death motion, like the the cut, like the cutthroat mm-hmm. death motion, and everyone laughs it off. And it's like, yeah. no, he's serious. He really means that. <laughs> yeah. And they, if you listen to all the dialogue from every cult member, they tell you they do not lie. Everything yep. they say is exactly what they mean. It's so true. I I have two related badges. I have first the it's written on the wall badge because Ooh. all of those portraits, all, all of those murals tell you exactly what's happening in like, I would say probably half the scenes in the movie yes. <laughs> telling you yes. exactly what's going to happen. And then I have the ellipsis badge for all these like unfinished conversations that like if they were to press a little bit further and ask more questions like all the details would have come out oh yeah like when they just are walking by the cage with the bear in it and they're like we're just not going to talk about the bear and the guy's just like it's a bear and then that's the end <laughs> <laughs> you're right they should have been like and they're just why? yeah that same <laughs> that same you know moment with pele when he's like nope you're done at 72 it's like well hold on <laughs> if they yeah. were like no really <laughs> interestingly above danny bed I noticed like before they leave for Sweden above her bed there was a picture of a girl and a bear like above her cup yes. and stuff I didn't catch it until like re-watching it and preparing and everything and then when they first get to the commune it's funny one of the friends make a joke that it's like Waco or whatever you know whole like David Koresh yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. yes. but they like they subtly just breeze past all these things like the skin the fool or the spirits go back to the dead yes. like all this stuff and then the shit ends up happening. Yeah, Everything yeah, yeah. this movie tells you exactly what's going on every single scene. Yeah. That's really interesting like just the horror of that because this isn't a movie of jump scares or anything. It's right. like the horror that yeah they're so um into their own selves that they don't they're not they can't even yes. in on the joke or they can't even see their fate because they're so narcissistic and into their making their own selves a deity or wanting to go impregnate women or whatever you know like yeah right that selfishness but that's like the horror you know that's the true horror of it all yeah totally and And Ari Aster has said Ari Aster has said too that you know what's going to happen when they drive to the middle of nowhere cult in Sweden like you know what the rest of the movie is so his he wasn't su- trying to surprise anyone. This was like not the mission of the movie. It was just to find creative ways <laughs> to get to those points that you knew were coming, you know? Well, I have a question now. So as you guys are watching this, maybe the first time or second time around, did you guys consider like, I always put myself in the movie, especially horror movies. Cause you're always trying to figure out, are you a protagonist? Are you a side character? Basically, would you survive this horror movie? And for this one, this one was like, at what point are you leaving this cult? Absolutely. Like, out of all of those characters, I felt like I was the Connie character. Like, as soon as they were at the, the hill and the first, and they see the the 72-year-olds getting carried off to their death, and then the first woman drops, and there's the, you know, the whole shocking scene, and it's such a slow burn with how the director plays it out. Like, I would have been that girl. And like looking around, like, why the fuck doesn't anyone else care? You know, 100 percent. I would be Connie as well. I wouldn't be the screaming guy 
who's flipping out on everyone, but I would try to quietly leave in the night. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I would like, and then finally Danny's like telling her boyfriend and, you know, Cheaty from the good place or whatever. And, <laughs> and like, screw no Cheaty for like knowing the night before what was going to yeah. happen and him being like, sweet, mm. we're going to watch this death of these old people. Weird anthropologist side of him. That's like, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. I'm going to be honest, that's a little bit of me because like, uh, I was considering like, if I was in this situation, I was like, uh, I also feel like, well, I'd also want to be respectful of their culture. Like, just thinking about the context of, like, like I don't know, oh, man. maybe you would definitely get. I know into I, a cult. I would. I know you guys do not let me near. If you see me getting near any kind of cult vibes or a person, if I introduce you to like, you know, someone that feels a little off in a big white robe and a flower crown, stop me, stop <laughs> me, because I won't know. Because I, I. I'm Florence Pugh. I'm just like, I'm kind of, I'm like kind of getting into it. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I know, but it's like, but I, but I did in my brain for a second think like it in a, in a sort of a fictional way of like, well, I mean, I guess I don't really know everything. Maybe human sacrifices do make good crops. I don't really know. I can't (laughs) say. Who am I to say that that's wrong? Even though morally I do understand that that's wrong. But there is a part of me that's like historically, I'm like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to judge another person's culture. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm mean, sure. And, and Christian <laughs> also tells Danny that as well, right? And, right. And yeah. Danny's the one that, like, you know, gets the rebirth and and everything through it. So she's the one that ultimately, quote unquote, drinks the the cult Kool-Aid or whatever. We make this joke all the time about believing women in horror movies, but the very first scene. <laughs> Uh, when Danny is like, when she's talking to Christian on the phone and she like, I have a bad feeling, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever. And then Dan, and then uh, Christian goes to his friends and like, oh, she's just being hysterical or whatever. And it was like, oh no, she was her. No, she was very, very right to have a bad feeling about this message from her sister. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For me, that opening sequence is by far the scariest part of this movie. <sighs> It wrecked me. And just the sounds that Florence Pugh makes when she's wailing, like it's heartbreaking. It <laughs> it's is horrible. Heartbreaking. I I had a badge, I wanted to call it the Aster Whale badge, uh, for making his leads whale in the <laughs> reef. Like Tony Collette and yeah. Terry has a very similar similar sort of like uh relationship with grief where she's really dealing with a lot of things in her family and like but it comes out in such physical vocal ways for mm-hmm. tony collette and for florence Pugh in this movie and it is no that the first time i saw it i like i i you could feel it inside of yes. your body and her breathing and her panic attacks throughout i had a <laughs> A pew, pew, pew badge for Florence Pugh <laughs> nailing this part. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good badge. I like that one a lot, Robin. <laughs> but but I do like some of those Aster devices that he uses, like the wailing of his female um, leads, like Tony Collette grieving her the loss of her daughter, like... Florence Pugh grieving the loss of her sister and her and her parents and then like the whole head smashing thing like losing off with their oh. head sort of situation oh, as well I feel like that's an Ari Aster yeah trope yeah so why does he keep doing that I know they're so what? brutal oh man when they smash the old man's head with that giant mallet ugh. and they keep going I after he's like, like, clearly oh. done <laughs> yeah yeah I did it's early during the scene of the two 72 year olds who killed themselves, uh, there, yeah, a little part of my brain was like, leave, you guys, you guys should leave. Leave this place right now. This is not for you. Leave. But then that little part of me, I was like, oh, but look at this like giant dinner table and all these supportive women <laughs> hanging out with me. So I don't know. Well, that was kind of the thing, right? In between those two parts, it was like Florence Pugh like goes like, why did you even want me here? Or why did you want me to come? And then Pella's like all manipulating and gaslighting Mm -hmm, her. mm -hmm. I was most excited for you to come. Like trying to (laughs) talk her about losing his parents, trying to get her to stay and everything, which is leading up to his big kiss with her later. (laughs) 
Well, you know, all this stuff. I'm like, he's obsessed. Yeah. And he's like kind of a bad guy too. I guess they're all bad guys. But here's a question. Uh, Do you guys think that she was set up to be the May Queen? Or do you think that was just pure, pure coincidence? (laughs) That's a great question. It, It felt like it for me that they were trying to like push her into that May Queen role. Yeah. Yeah, I felt so too. Like there was that Pele moment, and then there was like another moment with an older member of the community, where he's like, he's like, "We're so happy to have you," and he like emphasizes the word "you," or it's something like that. Um, yeah. Where I was like, "Oh, that makes me think that they've like they've clocked her pretty early on." <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it, it, I mean, I guess they do say, I guess Pele, Pele, Pele. Sorry, I'm. I feel bad that I keep saying it differently. Um, because also the, um, the demon in hereditary, isn't that, isn't that demon named Pele or something? Pele, Um, Pele. Wow. So this dude, I just kind of keeps making different versions of the same movie. Um, (laughs) but it does seem like he probably went to the community first and was like, there's this woman that I'm secretly obsessed with that I think would be perfect addition to this community. Um, who needs us as much as we need her? Because I think there was a, a kind of, you know, a creepy tenderness that he really approached her with in sort of really, I think in his mind, really wanting to bring her into this warm, safe space. But then I wonder, because mm-hmm. they brought a specific number of people for the specific number of sacrifices that they needed, and mm-hmm. she tagged along as an extra person. Yeah. I wonder if they didn't expect her or... Yeah, because if she wasn't going to be the May Queen, who would it have been? Connie was out of there, so is that not her? Right. <laughs> well, and I was like, are they trying to pivot away? Because, you know, like, even when Danny was, like, trying to tell Christian, like, hey, these people, like, it's weird. Connie and Simon, like, got separated, you know? Like, they're not together. Like, this is weird. Then he's like, yeah, babe, just hold on. Like, and then he goes and continues to ask, interview the guy about incest. Yeah. Stuff like that. So then I was like, oh, maybe they're, like, choosing her to be like, you know, fresh meat or whatever, to start like a new generation of like their cult or to give it more of a rebirth or whatever. Yeah. Cause they also seem, they were very specific about sort of their birthing practices mm-hmm. uh, and like very, very intentional with how they sort of paired each other up. And I think, because I think that like, I mean, I think that probably when they saw Danny and Christian, they kind of targeted both of them. Cause I think also right away, Christian got super hardcore targeted by the cult that they were going to like take his sperm and nothing else, you know? And that was also kind of an interesting thing, the way that got turned around on him. And I know, yeah, I guess I'm supposed to feel bad, but do I feel bad? I don't know. I don't know. What did we learn? What did you guys learn from this? Did we learn anything? I like do think about it, like Danny's character growth and everything and the rebirth and and all of that, like all of those themes. And I put myself in that role and I definitely want to grow from that and learn from her in those ways. Do I want to be in a cult? Absolutely not. <laughs> right. Um, also, do I want to go to Sweden at this point? <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I do. Um, but I might hang out in Stockholm instead. Right, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have uh, a this is my favorite badge that I came up with for this, okay. but I just realized it has to be a two part badge. So it should be two badges, like a yin yang badge. You know what I mean? Right. So the first mm-hmm. part is the uh, Olivia Rodrigo badge to Danny because good for her. She looks happy as hell. Yes. <laughs> but the oh, companion badge it. is the, Oh shit badge <laughs> because <laughs> I think it's all messed up. I don't think she should be happy as hell. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm-hmm. I came Love up with it. a badge called Hot Girl Somar. <laughs> yes. Oh, my oh, God. So We're making t-shirts. I love it. <laughs> and its companion badge is the Co- Coachella Couture badge. Because <gasps> all the female members of the cult. Yes. Especially that is, flower crowns. That's so Great. good. No, that's really good. Those are... That's, we should make shirts. That's excellent. I love that. Hot Girl Somar. Hot Girl Somar. I'm <laughs> into it. I'm into it. Alicia. <laughs> Where can we find you in the world? Oh, that is a great question. You can find me on Twitter, DJ Alicia Sweeney, or on Instagram, DJ Alicia. Between the two, I prefer Instagram where I post more. 
And on there, when you click on my bio, you can link up with me on the radio. I'm on weekdays on Indie 1023. It's all the best new indie rock. Um, there's links to interviews that I've done, and I've done some rad interviews over this past year, ranging from like rising star Arlo Parks to um, post-punk legends Gang of Four. Um, I've been doing these artist tarot readings called Talk Tarot Tunes, which has been really cool with musicians over this past year. And so all of that- Wait, are you reading tarot to them? Are you reading their tarot cards? I'm reading their tarot cards. So I do this thing, it started summer 2020 during quarantine where the band Man Man, I was interviewing the front man of the group, Honus Honus, and um, he likes Jordowski. And I was telling him that I have the Jordowski tarot deck. And then we decided that I would read his cards live. So we did a talk, which was the interview portion. And then I read his tarot and then he played me tunes. So I call it Talk Tarot Tunes. And that's something I'm doing on Indie 1023. That's an exclusive component online. So I'm always doing kind of cool music related things. Um, I just contributed to NPR Music's 50 Turning 50, which is like 50 songs turning 50 in 2021. So I got to write about uh, some of my favorite songs turning 50 this year, like Mambo Sun by T-Rex and Mushroom by Can. And so, yeah, I'm always online doing something about music. And I'm also talking about horror films every October. I do 31 days of horror music videos. So you can link up with that on my uh, bio on DJ Alicia on Instagram. Alicia, I'm going to join your cult. I I, you just that. sold me. You sold me. I'm going to join <laughs> your cult. Let me in there. Let me in there. Let's read tarot and listen to nothing. music and watch horror movies. Come on, Robin. We're going. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Bunk 237, a horror movie podcast, starts yet when, and Robin Zlotnick is the final girls of Bunk 237. And introducing Alex Skoke as camp director Susan Check. The show is produced by me, Shane Segretti. Our theme song is written and performed by Dan Zlotnick, and our outro music is written and performed by Alex Slasher. You can rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, and it may be featured on an upcoming episode. Have a badge of your own for this movie? Follow us on Instagram at Bunk237Pod and Twitter at Bunk237, and let us know. If you haven't already, please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are downloaded.